Hey, we have an online campus, and I know what's going on this morning. There's a lot of them sitting at the house in their Superman underoos this morning. <laughs> you ain't fooling nobody. And I'm going to give you one break, and that's, this is the one. This is the one. This is the one break you get every year. Let us know where you're watching from and what uh, kind of pajamas you're in. And, <laughs> but y'all came, so we're going to give you our very best this morning. Amen? Amen. Kathy Cochran, come on up here and preach this morning. Man, I said your very best, and she's sitting on the front row. Welcome, everybody. Just a couple of things to mention to you uh, while we're, we're getting moving. Uh, Women's Fellowship is this Thursday at 630. If you are a lady and you'd like to be there for that. Quinetta Lewis, I don't know if she's here this morning. She's going to be the speaker for the night. She has a great testimony. You, you will want to hear that. But more than anything, just getting together with the ladies on Tuesday, next Tuesday, March the 19th at 6.30 p.m., the ladies are starting with their small group. So if you have not gotten into small groups yet, you'd like to, Tuesday night, Kathy Cochran is going to be leading that. What is the name of that group? Without wavering. You want to be a part of that. The fam groups are ongoing. If you see that little card that's in front of you there on the seat, you just click on that thing. It'll tell you all about our connect groups and how you can connect with everything that we're doing around here. It's a great resource. Uh, tonight, men, if you have signed up to be involved in the men's uh, group, we will be sending out a Zoom call this, if, this evening uh, if I can get it right. I Remember, I'm just a caveman, so I'm probably going to mess it up. So keep your expectations lowered, and we'll, we'll get together then. If you have your Bible... Turn with me to the book of Habakkuk chapter 3, please. Habakkuk chapter 3. If you hold your Bible on its end like this and let it fall open, it will not fall open to the book of Habakkuk. Because <laughs> it's not a book that you typically would go through or go to. But I believe God's given me something this morning that I want to pass along with you. Habakkuk chapter 3 is actually a prayer. He is praying. He comes to the end of this prayer, starting with me in verse 17. <clears throat> he says, even though the fig trees have no blossoms. The fig tree is a, is a biblical symbol of fruitfulness, prosperity, wisdom, and success. That's what the fig tree represents. So Habakkuk says, even though, listen to this all in context, even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails... The fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die, die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty. He is portraying a picture of things that are going wrong with no hint of getting any better. Because all of those things represent not just an immediate need, but something that produces for the future. He said, if all of this is going wrong. But then he says in verse 18, yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, able to tread upon the heights. What you see is a succession of six failures. One right after another, he says, if this is wrong, and this is wrong, and this is wrong, and this is wrong. And he gives six in a row, which incidentally is biblical, biblically the number of man, which is a number of incompletion. But you will also see that Habakkuk says this, and I love how he comes right out and says this. He said, I'm just going to praise the Lord anyway. I'm just going to praise God anyhow. As you read the book of Habakkuk, you might find yourself in it from time to time. As you begin in chapter 1, if you have your Bible, you can flip a couple pages back. At verse 2, he begins with a lamentation that is involving the, the moment that he finds himself in. And he says, life is a mess. He turns his attention toward God and said, Lord, how long will I cry out and you will not hear me? How long will I cry out for help and get none? Violence is everywhere. Everywhere I look, is, I see destruction. The law in this age is non-existent. Judgment has been completely forgotten and wickedness surrounds us. Wickedness is everywhere. Does that, any of that sound familiar? <laughs> You're in the right place this morning. In chapter 2, I love this. that He seems to gain some resolve. My daddy used to say it can't stay bad forever. He gains a little bit of resolve. And he says in chapter 2, he said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. He said, I'm just going to sit down and wait on God. I'm just going to sit here on a watchtower and I'm going to see what God is going to do about this. Because he knew God well enough to know God's not going to leave stuff like that alone. Right, right. By the beginning of chapter 3, he has come full circle in prayer. 
And he begins, as you read through chapter 3, to magnify God. He begins to say from his heart how he knows the greatness of God for himself. As you read it, you find that there are three main themes that are repeated through the book that are still needed in our lives right now. Number one, hope for the future. As you read this book, you find that there are these three main themes. Number one, hope for the future. Number two, you can have faith in the face of chaos. And lastly, number three, there will be a divine answer to the question of injustice. There will be. There will be. There will be. The answer to the question, does God even care, is going to be answered. This morning, I want to strengthen your faith. I'm here on an assignment this morning, and, and, and I don't know where this will end, but I noticed it three times in verse 17. He uses that little simple two-word phrase, even though. Even though. He uses it three times. It's a simple phrase that means, listen to this, despite the fact, despite, listen, the reality. People say about Christians, they say about Jesus people all the time, y'all people don't live in reality. Habakkuk says, despite the fact that this is a reality, it's not denial. It is acknowledging the reality of a thing, but then saying, as Habakkuk said, I'm believing in an even greater reality. See, that's called faith, and the devil don't know what to do with faith. Today, I'm going to talk with you about that little simple phrase, even though, and I pray that God's going to bless you before you came. I hope you came in here ready. I hope you don't have your feelings all up on your shoulders. Nobody, nobody worried about getting your feelings hurt today? Because I'm coming. Father, give us a word today in due season. Let everything that we hear bring us closer to you, and we thank you for it. And they said together, amen. amen. One of the greatest lessons that I've learned in life, and I've taught myself to repeat, to remind myself that I need to keep my faith where it needs to be is this, that everything in life is how you see whatever it is that you are looking at. I don't know where I stumbled into that, but it, it's become a lifesaver for me. Everything in life is how you see whatever it is that you are looking at. It never ceases to amaze me that two people can look at the exact same thing and yet see something so completely different that you wonder if they're looking at the same thing or not. It's the story of the old shoe salesman that was sent to a third world country. He was flown on a jet to go to a third world country. He got off the jet and he had immediately sent back a message to his main office and said, I am returning home. No one here wears shoes. As soon as he got back, they sent another salesman to that exact same spot. The man got off the jet. He sent a message back to the corporate office. He said, send me every pair of shoes you got. Nobody here has any shoes. So, so it's that reality that everything in life, somebody just got a revelation is how you see whatever it is that you are looking at, and it's called perspective. Amen. And everyone has one. And your perspective is entirely yours. Your perspective is, is entirely yours, and it is, is, it is affected by hundreds and hundreds of variables that, that go everywhere from sociology to economic standing to race to gender to life experience to faith and failure and everything in between. And all of those things can change based on age and the seasons of your life. What that means is that at my age right now, I don't see anything the same way I saw it when I was 18 years old. At 18 years old, I thought $50 was a lot of money. You can't even buy lunch at Longhorn now for $50. I don't see anything the same way. My, my perspectives as I live here now in this life are shaped by time and life and experiences. They have been shaped by successes and failures, wins and losses, triumphs and tragedies, trial and error, all of that. And, and then as you talk about perspectives, there is also this. It's, it's also true that we, listen to me very carefully, we often see what we want to see. See, if you want to see the best in life, you will. And if you want to see the worst in life, you will. Even if both of you two are looking at the exact same thing. And when you look at the world that you and I are living in right now, there is a lot to disagree on. But there is one thing that most of us can agree on, and it is this, that there is something terribly wrong in the world that we're in. 
That was a little bit less than I expected, but there was something terribly wrong in this world that we are living. And before we get all doom and gloom, I'm not saying that there's not any beauty or hope or inspiration in the world today, but, but in many ways, our world is so messed up on so many different levels that we don't even know where to start when we're going to try to enumerate the craziness that is in the world that we are in right now. We don't even know where to start. The good news is that for us as believers, that, that, that for us, because of our faith, we can open up a Bible and we can say, here it is, right here. Because of our faith, because we have faith in God and because we have the written word of God, at any time, in any situation, we can open up that Bible and say, well, it's all right here. All you have to, to do to know what's, if you are lost, it's right here. If you are confused, your answers are right here. If you need to know what would, you should do in this, it's, it's in the word of God. Everything in this book is being played out right now. My dad and I, I brought my dad's Bible with me this morning because I kind of wanted to have him standing here with me today while I delivered this. But we used to have long conversations about the world that he grew up in and the world that I was growing up in. And my dad said so many times, son, you won't recognize the world. And he's right. Is there anybody else in here who's old enough now to look at this world and say, I don't even recognize the world that I'm living in right now. But I do recognize this, that Matthew chapter 24 is a living reality that is happening right now. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Famines, plagues, pestilences, earthquakes in many different places. All of these things, he said, are the beginning of sorrows. Second Timothy chapter 3 is being played out right in front of our eyes. This know also that in the last days, perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of their own selves. And I walked through all of that to get us here, that the net effect of living in a world like that is that living in a world like that will affect you. Even if you say it doesn't, it does. I'll say it, living in that world has affected me. Living in a world like that has a net result of affecting you. You find it sometimes that darkness starts creeping back in. And the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 2 that as Lot lived in Sodom and Gomorrah, the phrase that was used to, to describe what it did to him was that it vexed his soul. That, met that righteous man living in that unrighteous age, it vexed his soul day by day. That, that phrase literally means that it per creates and it perpetuates torture, turmoil, and toil. So living in that world affects you. And so now what I'm hearing more and more, more than I've ever heard in my life, are people voicing questions about all of it. If you, are, if you are actively living out your faith, then you're experiencing the same thing. More than I have ever heard or seen in my life, people are asking questions about all of this, about life and faith, religion, God, heaven, hell, the devil, the future. What in the world is going on? And what's interesting is that in this moment, the world that you are and I are living in, in this moment, there is almost, listen carefully to me, there is almost no neutrality to it. There, 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 there used to be some gray. There used to be some shades of gray. Brother, sister, right now, the world that we're living in right now, there is almost no, none of that. There is either light or there is dark. There is good or there is evil. There is in or there is out. We see it. We see it in all of our social media platforms. We've made the decision. <laughs> he made the decision. <laughs> To, to, to actively go bigger and to go after all of that. And, and we see this clearly, constantly. With, with everything that we do, there is one segment of society that is engaged in what we're doing. And then there is another society that is enraged by what we are doing. We post a little thing, a little message about God, and predictably, one group advances towards that like it is an oasis that they're trying to find rest for their soul, and another group just attacks it because that's what they do. And what it highlights is the loss of or the growth of faith in God. I'm trying to build something here, so just hang with me here. All that people are experiencing right now in the world that they are living in right now is either compelling them or repelling them. 
all that they are experiencing is either compelling or repelling. It is another phrase. It is either building or it is breaking. It is restoring or it is rebuking. So many people who had lost faith. So many people who had lost faith are finding it again. As they are living in a world that tells them that what they heard as a child sitting in church was all wrong. Everything that you heard was a lie sitting in church. Churches, they, they, they just lie to you. They're finding out now that everything that they are seeing with their eyes is telling them that it is real. And I was one of those. At the age of 14 years old, I turned away from God. I don't, I don't know how hard you did, but I turned away from God with everything that I had and ran as far away from God as I could go. I didn't want anything to do with God or faith or religion or Jesus or none of it. And as time went on, I started to remembering that all that I had heard. And when I looked at the world around me, I could literally see it happening with my own eyes. And everything in me told me that there must be some reason that they're telling me it was wrong. But here I see it happening with my own eyes. Listen to this. Don't get upset when I say this phrase. Don't ever curse the darkness or damn the devil as he works because everything that he means for evil, God is going to use it for good. The prodigal one day, the prodigal one day, the prodigal one day woke up in the pig pen and said, I remember when I had a better life somewhere else doing something else. I remember something that I had long since forgotten. And now I see that as the world has gone crazier than we ever dreamed it could possibly go, the end result is that right now get ready to shout this is a time of restoration as people who grew up believing fell away from God but now the world as it is is turning them right back to God they're starting to see that they were lied to by the world not by the church the, that God is real the Bible is true and if God is real and the Bible is true then I don't need to be looking down I need to be looking up because Jesus said that's where he's coming from he said, when all these things happen, lift up your head. Your redemption is drawing nigh. Church, shout with me, our Redeemer lives. Our Redeemer lives. I don't need to be afraid. Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world that I'm living in. I don't need to be afraid. I don't need to be ashamed. I don't need to be afraid to take my stand. This world... You need to be a person walking through this world every day saying, I am not depressed, I am blessed. I am not defeated, but I'm seated with him in heavenly places. Uh, this world is not falling apart as the world is trying. Oh, it's falling apart. No, it's not. It's coming together just as all the apostles and the prophets told us before that at any moment, Jesus is coming back. Now is not a time for you to, many of you were prodigal people who got tired of pig pen lives. Where y'all at? Any reform prodigals in the building? You got tired of pig pen lives. Oh, I'm having so much fun. <laughs> I got to get back to the, the sermon. All of which brings us to Habakkuk, which is one of the most interesting little books in the entire Bible. Not just the Old Testament, but the whole Bible. Habakkuk lived at a time of injustice and idolatry, which is what caused him to cry out in chapter 1 when, when he said what he did. He said, Something that might sound familiar to us. He said, Lord, how long is this going to go on? How long will I cry out to you for help and we will get none? The law is slack. There is no justice. And wickedness seems to surround us. Good people, it seems like, always get the short end of it. So, Lord, what, what are you doing? As a prophet of God... He saw the same thing then that is happening again in our time. Hang with me. He saw the rising threat of the Babylonian Empire. And without sounding too mysterious and conspiratorial, which I know that that's how it's going to sound, that is exactly what you and I are witnessing today. We are witnessing today the rise of another Babylonian Empire. Is this church like that? Yeah. Yeah. The resurgence of the spirit of Babylon. The Bible says that in the book of Revelation that Babylon will fall again. 
So if Babylon's going to fall again, then it by definition must rise again. And so it is rising again right now. Babylon, if you were wondering, is the symbol of all that is evil, immoral, and ungodly. It represents a spirit of control, ungodliness, injustice, tyranny, and oppression. That is the spirit of Babylon in a simple sentence. The word itself, Babylon, in one of its translations from the Hebrew tongue is the word confusion. And we have to know this, we have to be smart enough to recognize this, that when the history books are finally written about the age that you and I are living in right now, one of the words that's going to come up a lot is the word confusion. Am I right? We live at a time of confusion. That is the world that Habakkuk lived in, and that is exactly the world that you and I live in right now. What makes this little book different? is that while many of the Old Testament prophets were focused on messages that typically involved rebuking the people, Habakkuk, listen, listen, doesn't do that. I've studied it enough to, to you, you find out, make sure I'm right. It's incredible. Read it all again. He does not accuse Israel of anything, nor does he one time speak to the nation on behalf of God. <laughs> He's the most unprofit prophet in the whole Bible. He's not doing anything that prophets are supposed to do. That's what prophets did. They rebuked the people for their sins. He spoke to the people on God's behalf. That's not what Habakkuk did. And that's not throwing shade at any of the others because they had their own assignment. But in this book, listen. Oh, man. When I know what you don't, and I'm about to say it, I get tickled inside. I hope I never lose that. This is a revelation to everyone that living in a crazy world, no matter how strong you are, that craziness will eventually wear you down. Living in a, somebody testify. We keep our chins up, our shoulders back, our hands up in praise, our knees to the ground in prayer. But sometimes you will say, just as Habakkuk did, as you look at the world that you are in, what in the world is... Y'all don't make me go there. All I need is a little encouragement. And I'll go there. When they're putting litter boxes in school restrooms because kids identify as cats, they need a... Don't you dare. That's just messed up. Don't ask me to go along with your mental health nightmare. When a... When a... When a, when a, when a full-grown testosterone driven man enters into another sporting event because he wants to whip a woman at that event and everybody goes yay that's so good you've lost your ever loving mind no man should be competing against a woman in anything am I right we live in a crazy world as you read this book it's important to see as, as I see that all of his words are addressed to God he goes vertical Habakkuk is a discourse between a man and his God. And what it reveals is one of the most common struggles of all. It reveals Habakkuk's humanity and his personal struggle to believe when there is so much unrighteousness in the world around you. I don't know if anybody else feels that or not. How am I supposed to believe and keep believing when this is still happening around us? How am I supposed to believe that God is good even when nothing else around me is good? How am I supposed to smile when all I want to do is cry? And how many times have you ever been there? Church, not a rhetorical question. You've said to yourself, I'm doing this thing right. I'm living right. I'm praying right. I'm loving my neighbors. I'm walking this out. And yet, hold on, that word's coming back. Nothing makes sense. Life doesn't make sense. People don't make sense. People tell me that God is good, but everywhere I look, I see hate and hurt and pain and suffering and injustice everywhere. Palestinian people are killing Israelis, and Israelis are killing Palestinians, and they both say that they're right. We're living in a world right now when immorality is normalized and normal behavior is demonized. Y'all ain't going to help me. I'll do it by myself. I live in a world right now. We live in a world right now where people are not only calling for an end, you buckle up, not only calling for an end to Roe versus Wade, 
But state legislators are actively working to bypass parental consent so that a minor can have an abortion without the parent ever knowing that their 12-year-old child was pregnant in the first place. When legislators in our country are making laws that are normalizing child sex and pedophilia. Did you know that in these United States of America, 31 states in our union already have laws on the books that approve sex with minors? That an 18-year-old man could actively engage in sex with a 16-year-old child, and it is legal in 31 states in the United States of America. We live in a world right now where with the click of a mouse, one click of a mouse, the internet can track everything that I've done Everything that I've done and tell me in my email that there are 16 shirts for sale, just like the shirt that I just looked at, but they don't seem to be able to track child pedophilia anywhere in the world. They can't find out what's going on. You lie. You lie. When our, when our, when our entertainment and our entertainers is no longer hiding anything. Y'all ain't paying attention. They're not hiding anything. They used to slip a little thing in every now and again, a little symbol or a little hand motion, but now satanic rituals are happening up front in big lights on the biggest stages of our nation. People worshiping the devil out loud. I need to say this out loud. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, against principalities and powers, but don't let the people of God forget this, that we are in a fight once again with the spirit of Babylon. Habakkuk is feeling the same. He's feeling the same thing that I'm feeling in my soul right now. That we are witnessing this rise in the darkness that is around us. We're witnessing once again the rise of the spirit of Babylon. But he sees the darkness as an invitation to have faith in God's promises. I'm trying to do the same thing for you here this morning. Habakkuk, that statement of faith comes again in chapter 3, verse 17, 18, and 19. He says, read it with me again, even though the fig tree has no blossoms, there are no grapes on the vines, the olive crops fail, the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty. He said, yet I will rejoice. I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation because God, the sovereign Lord, is my strength. I love y'all. Sometimes life happens as it does to bring us to that place where you have to decide and find out what it is that you really believe. None of us get there the same. None of us get there the same. For you, you may have gotten there when your country, your company laid you off. For no good reason, one day you just walked in and there you are. They hand you the pink slip, say, thank you for being here. You're let go. You had to decide right then. Is that paycheck my source or is God my source? If God is my source, then I don't need to know anything else. God's got something better waiting for me just down the street. So I know it's going to be all right. Amen. For someone else, you got to that place when you had a miscarriage. Where it's your whole life. Believed. that One day it would be there for you that you and your husband, your spouse, you would have a child. You became pregnant, you told all your friends, you, and then you, you lost it. For someone else, the, it came for you when the doctor said, there's nothing else we can do. Those are, those are fearsome words. There is nothing else that we can do. And I bring myself back to a little saying that I've said for 20 years, anyone Anyone can sing a sweet tune at noon in June in the sunshine. But can you still say God is good when everything around you is messed up? Can you still say God is able even when it looks like he is not? Can you still say, yet I will praise this God because he is my strength? When his life fell to pieces, Job's wife who liked all of the stuff that she had as the wife of Job, walked into him and said, why don't you curse God and die? And Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Amen. Somebody say the word yet. Amen. What a word. What a little word. The word yet, it means 
so much more than you think it does. It means that there is something else that hasn't come up just yet. It means this story is not yet been told. I'm telling you this. It means that the story is not over. Something isn't finished. There's still something that is about to happen here. Habakkuk said, even though there is nothing left, it looks like it's over. Yet, I'm still going to praise him. Even though and yet go together. Even though and yet go together. Why? Because life happens. And there's a devil in the land. And you have to be able to say it, even though I'm hurting, yet will I praise him. Even though it didn't go my way, yet will I praise him. Even though it's all fallen apart, yet I will still stand here and I will praise him when everybody around me thinks I've lost my ever-loving mind, yet will I praise him because I know that God still sits on his throne. I know that God is still able. That same God is my strength. Martin Luther said, and I'm almost done. Singers, y'all do what you do. Faith is a living, daring confidence in God's grace. So sure and certain that a man could stake his life on it a thousand times. I never knew what that meant until I started to stake my life on this. See, in the American brand of religion, we're not staking our life on it. We don't have to. We got money. We all right. We get sick, we can run to the hospital. We're all right. If it all falls apart for you, the government will give you a check. They'll just call you disabled and start giving you money. Martin Luther said, Faith is a living, daring confidence in God's grace. So sure and certain that a man could stake his life on it a thousand times. Habakkuk said, even though all I can see is a mess, <laughs> yet I will rejoice. Y'all know anybody like that? I'm married to somebody like that. Amen. Oh, thank God for your, your pastor's wife. I will be joyful. For God is my strength. He is what Habakkuk said. He is hope for the future. Brother, sister, don't ever lose your hope. The three main themes of this book is number one, hope for the future. Let me tell you flat-footed, looking you in your face this morning, there is hope in your future. Because God is the one that holds your future, not Washington, D.C., not 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, not a, not a donkey, not an elephant. None of those guys hold your future. God holds your future. It doesn't matter who's sitting in the White House. What matters is who's sitting on the throne. And God is sitting on his throne. He'll make it happen for you. He'll make it happen for you. So you have hope for your future. Man, you ought to be high-stepping out of here this morning. When y'all walk out of here, y'all ought to be high-stepping out of here like y'all got something. Even if your car's on empty right now and it's, you got no money left and you <laughs> wondering what you're going to do, you walk out of here like Conor McGregor walking into the ring. I got this. Why? Because God's got me. I've got hope for the future. And I'll promise you this, that if you start walking and talking and living like that, you'll start believing that. And you'll, God will start showing you on his behalf what he can do. You have hope in your future. That's how Conor McGregor walks into a ring, right? <laughs> that clip's going to show up on YouTube. <laughs> Cut that out. Number two, I can have faith in the face of chaos. I don't need to engage the chaos around me. I just need to have faith in God. Hope, y'all ain't hearing me. Y'all didn't hear my sermon. Habakkuk did not engage the people. He did not do as the other prophets did and look at all the people and say, y'all know what you're doing? You're doing everything wrong. God's going to get you for that. No, God, Habakkuk looked up at God and said, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to believe you. You are an awesome God. You are my source. You are my strength. I will be joyful in you. I can have faith in the face of chaos. And lastly, 
I can live every day of my life filled with joy because I know that God is a God of justice. And God's going to work it out. You don't have to, you don't have to try to clear your name. <laughs> you, you don't have to try to clear your name. You don't have to try to convince your enemies. You ain't never going to convince them anyway. They're your enemy. They hate you. All you have to do is, that's my favorite part of the sermon right there. Just, just, just keep walking, man. Just walk. God is a God of justice. He will give you beauty for all of your ashes. That's all I brought this morning. Y'all stay tuned. Zaddy will be back next week. Bow your head with me, please. Let's pray. Father, there's some folks sitting in this room this morning that are caught up in even though. So this morning, I pray that we would add a yet to the even though. That I would not stop with even though. Because there's certainly enough ammunition to fill that gun. Even though the world is as crazy as it is yet, I will praise you. So Father, this morning, take this water and turn it into wine. Breathe on these words and make them live. Restore someone who desperately needed that this morning. Heads bowed, hearts are opened. Everything that has been said and done has brought us to this moment, to this point. Maybe you are, as Habakkuk was, living in a world that has just gone crazy around you. Maybe you came in here this morning not sure about hope, not sure about the future. Maybe the darkness and the pessimism of this age has started to creep in on you. I don't know how we're going to make it. I don't know how we're going to pay the bills. I don't know how we're... God brought you here this morning to speak hope into your spirit. You have hope for the future. Maybe you came in here this morning and you're all caught up in the, the discontent in the world that is around you and you, you want to straighten everybody out. You want to point a finger and you want to get everybody in the right place. But you can have faith in the face of all of that chaos because God is a God of justice. God's going to work it out. So I'm going to trust him to do that. I can live every day of my life with joy. This morning I want to give an invitation. As simple as this sounds, to prodigals who got tired of pig pen living. Maybe there's a prodigal in the building, a prodigal online, and maybe you're just tired of pig pen living and it's time for you to run home, run home to the Father. Run home to the Father. Rededicate your life, abandon yourself to God, and watch what God will do. Maybe there's somebody sitting in the room this morning that you, that's your greatest need. I just need to make things right between me and God in the world that I'm in. Others, God brought you here to speak that one word. You didn't hear anything else I said, but the word hope. That word hope has become a, a beacon light right now for you. Hope is found in Jesus. Hope is found in him moment I'm going to give an invitation for prayer and you're not coming to talk to me you're not coming to talk to us find a place to pray pray for a restoration the most important thing that I wanted to pray with people about this morning though is this thing here I think in a, in a living in a world that we live in as second Peter said it vexes your soul it vexes you it, it bring it produces torment and toil and torture. Living in that world causes that. It was so strong in my spirit this morning that I wanted to pray for everyone in here that you would pray this prayer. God, listen, listen, listen. Take me back to my first love. Take me back to my first love. Take me back to that simple place when I first met you, when I first came to you, when I first fell in love with you, that I trusted you completely, that I talked to you a lot that I knew you were my everything and I was going to follow you no matter what and it didn't matter what hell happened around me I knew you had my back it was going to be all right father take me back to my first love back before I started rationalizing everything and back before I started wanting vengeance on all of my enemies for the, all the nasty stuff they did take me back to that place where I can just love my enemies y'all ain't saying nothing lord take me back to my first love 
that place where I forgave quickly and I forgave easily and I gave people mercy even when they gave me none. Take me back to my first love, back before I became jaded and dark and bitter. Take me back this morning. I would love to see this church this morning with unison, all of us together in unison, God, pray. Take us back to our first love. Back to the simplicity of it all. All across the building, if you wouldn't mind, in a moment, I'm going to give an invitation for you to come to pray. I'm believing God to do something amazing in here this morning. The table is set. Are you hungry? The table is set. So Father, we bless you. We pray your kingdom come. Your will be done in these next few minutes, God. Let there be such a transformative power in this room that prodigals will run to you, that blinded eyes would open up, that, that broken, hurting souls would be restored. Father, thank you so much for what you're about to do in this room. All across the building, if y'all wouldn't mind, please stand on your feet this, this morning. You guys, if y'all will, come prepare to worship. And very simply, I'm giving you an invitation to meet God somewhere, to meet Him at the altar, meet Him at your seat, meet Him in a corner of the building, but to pray, Lord, do this thing in me. Maybe you are at an even though season right now in your life, even though, even though it has all happened like this, yet I'm going to praise Him and watch what God will do with it. Hey, I hope you enjoyed today's message. If you did, make sure that you share and subscribe so that we can get you these sermons as soon as they are available. I'd like to take a moment and thank everyone that's a part of the family. Whether you serve with us or give financially, it's because of you that we are able to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus. If you have any questions or would like to get more involved, click the link in the description. Thank you. Have a blessed week.